Hello everyone, it's Eric from Strong Medicine. Today I'm discussing a paper published last week in JAMA, or the Journal of the American Medical Association. Accuracy of a Generative Artificial Intelligence Model in a Complex Diagnostic Challenge by Kanji Crow and Rodman, all of whom are internists from Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. I picked this paper to discuss because, despite its relative brevity, it has important implications for the future of clinical medicine, irrespective of field, and because it's related to some work that I've been doing. In the first half of this video, I'll discuss what they did and their results, as well as how it relates to an earlier video I had posted back in January. And in the second half, I'll be talking about the study and what it means directly with one of the authors, Adam Rodman. To understand the study and its methods, you will need to be familiar with two things. The first, you already know, ChatGPT. This is, of course, the AI-driven chatbot initially released to the public last November and which has driven a resurgence of interest in artificial intelligence. The second thing is the New England Journal of Medicine's Clinical Pathologic Conferences, or CPCs. CPCs are educational conferences in which a clinical case including the history, physical exam, and diagnostic tests, is presented to one or more expert discussants in front of a large audience. The format is usually one of a diagnostic challenge, and the discussants often are not familiar with a specific case prior to the conference. Traditionally, once all the information has been shared, the discussants are asked to commit to a single most likely diagnosis before the patient's actual diagnosis is revealed. For me, Watching CPCs was one of the most memorable educational moments in medical school. Seeing a room filled with the entire department, from students on up to department chairs, it really emphasized that learning medicine is a lifelong pursuit. Plus, they're just kind of fun to watch. CPCs are held at most academic medical centers, but those held at the Massachusetts General Hospital are immortalized as transcripts published in the New England Journal of Medicine a tradition that is literally 99 years old. Going back to the paper, in essence, the author's methods consisted of three steps. First, they crafted a standardized prompt for ChatGPT that would result in the bot providing a differential diagnosis ordered by descending probability in response to a clinical case. Second, they fed into ChatGPT 70 CPCs from the New England Journal of Medicine from January 2021 through December 2022, up to but not including the discussant's initial response and differential diagnosis in each case. And third, they compared ChatGPT's responses to the actual answers from the cases. Their primary outcome of interest was whether the bot's top diagnosis matched the final published case diagnosis. Their secondary outcomes included whether the published case diagnosis was in the differential diagnosis at all, as well as the subjective quality of the bot's differential, using a previously published five-point rating system in which five means the differential includes the exact diagnosis, and zero means that none of the suggested diagnoses were close or helpful. Before going through their results, I want to compare what they did to something that I demonstrated on here when I first asked whether ChatGPT could pass my med school final. For that video, some of you may remember that I had entered the five most recent New England Journal CPCs into ChatGPT, uh, that is GPT 3.5, and had asked the bot to provide only a single top diagnosis. You might also recall that the bot did not do very well. Strictly speaking, it got all five wrong, though I did give it credit for one in which the bot's incorrect diagnosis was also the diagnosis of the expert at MGH. But this was only a proof of concept. I only ran five cases. There was no formal prompt engineering. There was no statistical analysis or secondary outcomes. What Kanji, Crow, and Rodman did here was far more involved. So what were their results? ChatGPT's top diagnosis agreed with the published final diagnosis in 39% of cases. And in 64%, ChatGPT included the published diagnosis within its differential. 39% and 64%, that might not sound like good diagnostic accuracy, but CPC cases are chosen specifically because they are challenging and often had been missed by the first handful of doctors who encountered the patient in real life. 
For example, there was a case in which the final diagnosis was labeled encephalitis due to Bichette's disease, where ChatGPT's leading diagnosis was the nearly synonymous neurobichette's disease. And its differential included various forms of infectious meningitis, CNS vasculitis, CNS lymphoma, neurosarcoidosis, and multiple sclerosis. I would consider at least half of this list to be so-called zebra diagnoses that many docs have never seen. But then there were a few even more challenging cases which ChatGPT totally missed the ball on. For example, the newly described anti-melanoma differentiation-associated protein-5 dermatomyositis, which the bot completely misdiagnosed as valley fever. Overall, compared to prior research, ChatGPT performed similarly to pre-existing dedicated differential diagnosis generators. But there is a key difference in that ChatGPT was not specifically designed to do this. It's a general-use chatbot that uses natural language processing. While these other programs are not necessarily difficult to use, ChatGPT is the first publicly available one in which the entire case can be copy and pasted into a single prompt. And despite what prior research has reported about these other diagnosis generators, I have been personally underwhelmed by them. Unlike other options, ChatGPT is able to incorporate more information, such as negative symptoms or the absence of a symptom, the relative severity of symptoms uh, compared to one another, and the specific time course. For example, which of many present symptoms was the first to occur? Those kinds of distinctions, they're just not possible with some of the other diagnosis generators. And in my opinion, most importantly, ChatGPT can provide an explanation of their suggested diagnosis, even if it can't cite specific references to support its responses. Now, returning to the paper, there were some limitations. First, there is some degree of subjectivity involved in determining whether a diagnosis suggested by the bot and the one from the published case were in fact the same. For example, I think everyone would agree that the bot's response of neurobichette's disease was the same as the published diagnosis of encephalitis due to Bichette's disease. But what if the bot's response had just been Bichette's disease without the neural prefix? It wouldn't be wrong per se, but it also doesn't feel specific enough to consider fully correct either. It's not clear how many times among the 70 cases a decision like that had to be made by the authors. Another limitation is that ChatGPT does not necessarily provide the same response to the same prompt every single time. In my January video, I showed that when giving the bot the same case of a 29-year-old with fever and shortness of breath and asking for the top four diagnoses 20 separate times, there was a lot of variability in how often it included certain diagnoses. But for this paper, the authors entered each case into the bot just once. I actually think this is less of an issue than it was for me because GPT-4, which is what they used, displays less variability in its responses to clinical cases than GPT-3.5, which is what I had used previously. And that assertion about less variability is, is based on evidence that I'll be talking about here next month. In my opinion, the biggest limitation to generalizing these results to the practice of clinical medicine is that the CPCs in the New England Journal of Medicine they have been specifically curated as a learning exercise. So while they are real cases and are diagnostically challenging and often involve rare diagnoses, many extraneous case details have been stripped from the case. In real life, these cases would have had much more data to sift through, the vast majority of which was irrelevant to the final diagnosis. And also in real life, diagnostic challenges, they don't always have answers. A patient can present with clinical features that are not consistent with any one specific disease, and we can do additional tests and even take biopsies, and yet the diagnosis can still remain elusive. Cases like that are not that uncommon, but they're not represented in the New England Journal CPC dataset because they are unsatisfying for learners, and thus they don't end up as publications. However, despite these limitations, I still think this is really big news. While the authors did not compare the performance of ChatGPT to an average general internist or hospitalist, based on this data, and based on my knowledge of the CPCs, and literally 
as of today, my 20 years of experience in internal medicine, I think the bot would likely at least match, if not beat, the performance of an average hospitalist on this one task of diagnosing complex cases which have definite answers. Now, this is absolutely not to suggest that doctors are going to be replaced soon. For one thing, we do a lot more than just make diagnoses from data. But it does strongly suggest that there is a very real role for this technology, um, like a, a HIPAA compliant analog of ChatGPT, in clinical practice. At this point, I, I'm going to turn and talk directly with one of the authors about their work here, and I want to see what they see as its implications. We are really fortunate today to be joined by one of the authors of, uh, of the study I've just been talking about. Uh, this is Adam Rodman. Uh, Adam is a hospitalist at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, uh, where he's co-director of the Innovations in Media and Education Delivery Initiative. Uh, he's also the host of a wonderful pod, uh, medical podcast called Bedside Rounds, which you should all check out. And I'll put a link to that in the, uh, the video description. Uh, and he's also an enthusiast uh, of the history of medicine. And I've learned a lot about sort of how we got to where we are currently with things like uh, clinical diagnosis and and rounding and problemless and how we even approach patients um, from listening to him and, and, and reading his, uh, his his tweets and tutorials. So uh, so thank you, Adam, for being here. That was a very generous introduction. Thanks, Eric. Uh, also, well, this is this is a little contrived, but huge fan. I've known you for years, but really <laughs> excited to be here. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, so uh, so I just talked about your, your study a bit in terms of the results. Um, and uh, and it was it was it was really really fascinating for me because it's something I've been thinking about, and you know I've been thinking about this for in the last six months or so since ChatGPT was uh, released onto the world. Were you surprised by any of the results? I honestly, I was really surprised by the results. I did not think it was going to turn out as good as it did. Uh, were you surprised by the results? Uh, a little bit. Um, I you know because I, I think that and I, you know you, uh, we were just talking about this um, that. You know, I had played around a little bit with uh, some of the CPCs from the New England Journal with with uh, GPT 3.5, and was sort of I won't, I won't say I was underwhelmed, but it wasn't like it didn't blow me out of the out of the water. Um, and then seeing just like how much of an improvement there was from 3.5 to 4 uh, with with your study, and obviously you know you, what you did was was far more robust than the little you know ex extremely uh, rudimentary proof of concept I had done. But uh, yeah, I was I was a bit surprised by how much how much it improved even from 3.5 to 4 and whether or not that was the the the, uh, the GPT version update or whether or not it was the value of the prompt engineering you guys had had done i don't know no it's it's definitely the 4 update because we uh we tested it out with the with 3.5 with the same prompt it's honestly what inspired the study so when 3 i was is equally as excited uh when chat gpt with 3.5 was released as you um, I'd actually used GPT three before, uh, like with a, a paid a paid chatbot with tokens, um, and was always like I, I did not see any medical uses for it. I'm sure, like you know, it it hallucinates all the time, yeah. even when it was accurate. It was accurate for all the wrong reasons. And mm -hmm. looking at kind of the long arc of um, of medical diagnostics, like an LLM, a large language model, didn't fit into it. I assumed, as I, I'm sure you did that when there'd be a diagnostic machine, it'd be this sort of like fancy Bayesian network that looks at all the epidemiologic data and then looks at the tests and spits out a number. So when 3.5 came out, I was like, this is this is a novelty. And then I think like you, within two days of using uh, GPT 4.0, I was like, this is this is something different. Uh, this is something that I think no one in the, uh, the differential diagnosis community expected or saw. Uh, and that's what inspired me to, or us to do the study. Yeah, no, I agree. It seems like this this technology, like or this 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 approach, um, and I want to say this approach because that sort of implies that this was the, the you know OpenAI's intent was creating a medical diagnosis generator, which obviously it's, it was not its its primary purpose. But I, I feel like it it does feel like it came out of nowhere. Um, you know, I also assumed that you know a differential diagnosis generator of the future would be like a Bayesian machine, right? Yeah. Like you. You have these symptoms. You you plug in the symptoms. You plug in a problem representation, and and it just calculates all these probabilities based on all based on you know these tables of of data that it has stored, and and it calculates it again very sort of very formal probabilistic reasoning, and ChatGPT doesn't work at all like that, um, which is kind of fascinating to me. 
it, it appears, I mean, this is what we're studying. And when I say we, it's not the royal we, it's literally you and me um, and, and many other people. But it appears that ChatGPT, when it makes its decisions, works on like reasoning processes that might be similar or at least comparable to how a human mind works, as opposed to, and you and I both know this, right? Like we teach evidence, quote unquote, evidence-based diagnosis all the time. That is not how the human brain works. That is not yeah. how the human brain has ever worked. EBM is an attempt to make humans think like, uh, or EBD is to make humans think like computers from the 1970s. Um, and then all of a sudden you have a, a computer that, and I think both of us know there are many ways in which it does not work like a human brain or is like an insane human brain or could even be dangerous. But these LLMs appear to like offer another path for a diagnostic machine that is really powerful even in the year 20, like in what, in when we did the study in March, April, 2023. Yeah, no, I, it's interesting because when you, when, we, when you hear people talk about um, how ChatGPT how it arrives at answers and people say, oh, it doesn't, it doesn't think like a human, doesn't think like a human. That's sort of like the, ge the general gestalt of, or the sort of the general impression oftentimes you hear about online. But I think as you're pointing out, it, it's probably closer to how we reason than, you know, calculating these, you know, making these biostatistical calculations that, yeah, and, that and it totally class. like no one does that in real life. I, uh, one of the things that we did as we did the study, because we use lots of these prompts and, and you and I are now studying this more formally, but you ask it why it's making the decisions and it spits out something that is remarkably similar to what you and I would call an illness script or a problem yeah. representation. And then when it can tell you why one thing and why not the other, it effectively can walk you through a schema. Like it is thinking about diagno thinking, I'm going to do air quotes, about different diagnoses in relation to one, one another and what fits and what doesn't fit. One of the uh, cool studies that I, I is currently under review is that it appears to also uh, grok Bayesian reasoning. Like it has an understanding of... Um, and, and this is not from epidemiologic data. It has like, just like you and I do, right? Like somebody comes with a cough and fevers and you, we, we have an, an understanding of what our base rate of pneumonia is, even if we couldn't put a number to it. And it appears to have a similar quote unquote understanding that appears to be superior to a human understanding. So weird. And it's like an alien um, <laughs> trying to understand. Uh, and and there's so many things that are wrong with it right now, but like even in yeah, even GPT four is 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 quite impressive, even if it's not ready for prime time. Yeah, no, I, the whole the whole Bayesian reasoning bit that that GPT four that I know you've been working on, um, it's 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 like one of these emergent properties. Like it's not designed to do that, but somehow it can do it anyway, which is really kind of a little bit a little bit creepy, I think. I so yeah, when working with and I actually I'm curious about your um. Yeah, both of us have probably spent what, like hundreds of hours uh, engaged with these things, studying them. Yeah. And you start to like think that you're talking to a physician. You know that you're not, but you start to use languages like think and reasoning. And it's, um, you have to pinch yourself and remind yourself that this is a computer algorithm. Yeah. And I've never felt like that with like, uh, you know, the 4T score. I've never been like, wow, this is such a smart computer doctor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean something else that we 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 tried, you know, in addition to the, you know, I know you've been working on the Bayesian reasoning, you know, we tried some metacognition where we would give it a case where a physician, um, a physician essentially made an error, and we asked it what, um, what cognitive bias do you think the physician experienced to lead to the misdiagnosis, and it does really really well with that, um, which is also something which it also feels like an emergent property that I would not have expected it to be able to do. And then the question is, do you have a sense on how it does with that compared to a human, right? Is it better than a human at picking up cognitive biases in our thinking? Yeah, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't compared it with, with, uh, with practicing physicians. We've compared it to students, uh, and we're going to have to, to wait on the results of that for a few weeks. But <laughs> um, I want to I wanna talk a little bit about, you know, because, you know, there's been differential diagnosis generated. It's just sort of so like along the same lines of what we've been talking about. There's been other differential diagnosis generators in the past that have been used. I remember one from my residency called D-Explain. I, I, I use D-Explain as a medical student, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so you, you plug in symptoms, um, and it gives you a, a list of diagnoses um, based. And then you can actually you know, ask some, some clarifying questions or prompts you to, to add more information. And I know you've talked before about uh, a particularly famous one called Internist One. Um, do, you, do you think ChatGPT is superior to these other sort of more uh, these other algorithms, the other these other programs that were designed specifically for differential diagnosis? 
Do you think a, a general chatbot like ChatGPT is actually superior to those, or do you think it performs comparably, or how, how would you study? compare those? Yeah, I mean, so the technical answer is our study in what we studied, which is the ability to come up with a useful differential diagnosis, performs as well as the the top performing currently uh, differential diagnosis generator, which is Isabel. Um, and Isabel was actually around when you and I were, though it was, a, it, it ran differently. Isabel uses natural language processing now. So it performs as well in the task that we gave it as Isabel. Now, I think you and I both know that chat GPT doing medical things is much more than just a differential diagnosis generator. So I, I think within that domain, it's equivalent, but that's crazy because it wasn't designed to do that. These are, as you say, emergent properties. Yeah. And my gut feeling, and this is what we're studying, is that it's going to be a much more useful tool in this iteration than any of the commercial differential diagnosis generators are right now. Yeah. I mean, can, can Isabel, for example, exp explain the reasoning behind the, the diagnoses like ChatGPT can, or is it not able to do that yet? Uh, you know, I've actually never, I, I used Isabel when I was a resident and that was the Bayesian Isabel, which could tell you the yeah. new Isabel doesn't work like that. So I actually don't know what Isabel will and will tell you, but back when I used Isabel, which is, this is showing my age, it would tell you what factors. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cause I mean, DXplain doesn't really do that. I mean, DXplain would just pop out at least the, the version that I remember from is like 10 years ago, at least the last time I used it, but um, it would just spit out a list of diagnoses and there was like no reasoning. You know, there was there was like tiers of like most likely, less likely. Yeah. But aside, that was like the most analysis you got from the diagnosis that spit out. Yeah, we used, I mean, DXplain was assigned to me to use as a medical student. I think if you look in the literature, a lot of these things are used as teaching tools, mm. which of course, we're both medical educators. It raises this idea, how are we going to use large language models as medical educators, right? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a big that's, that's a big question, which actually leads into the next thing I want to talk about, which was, you know, how do you see this being used in clinical medicine? I mean, do you do you see us using chatbots like on the wards and in clinics to, to, to diagnose patients in the next few years? Or do you think that's still a long ways away? Or like, so what are the what are the barriers to getting us there? Uh, right now, well, so we can, we'll do the elephant in the room right now. Open AI's chat GPT is not HIPAA compliant. You cannot put any protected health information into it. Now, Microsoft through their Azure, Azure, a, a, how do you pronounce the word A-Z-U-R-E, Azure? I'm not sure I know. <laughs> through their Azure platform is soon to release a HIPAA compliant chatbot. So that's not going to be an issue. And there will be future chatbots based on like MedPalm or Alpat, like all of all of these different large language models. Um, right now, if you could assure HIPAA compliance, I actually think there is a role for diagnostic clinical decision support with the technology as it is now with a skilled physician, right? Using it, because if you look at what a CPC is, it, it's put together, right? A human mind has sorted through the data, put it into a story that's meaningful. So if you or I had a really difficult patient and we, you know, we had a good sense on what was going on, but we wanted to make sure we expanded our differential or, or we were worried about bias, I think it might be helpful to do that right now. Now, I think there are many, so many unknowns about ChatGPT and one of the big, or large language models in general. And one of the big questions for me is how is, like you and I have fully formed, not fully formed, but we our brains have been trained in the old fashioned way of seeing a lot of patients and getting feedback on them. So how is using an LLM going to change the way that we think about our, our patients? And like, how does the human computer interaction work, right? Uh, there's, there's examples in radiology where actually expert phys physicians did worse well, looking at the the read because it made them second guess themselves. So I think these are all like important questions that we have to answer, as well as some of the black box stuff of large language models. Uh, there's reason to think that the black box models show some of the same like gender and racial biases that we do. And I think that's something that needs to be explored. That being said, all of those caveats, I the technology right now is is useful. In a couple of years, I can only imagine that it's going to be more useful and that this is going to be one of the realities of practicing medicine going forward. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you, I mean, it almost feels like the role of the doctor at some point, you know, I know people, I don't, I'm not suggesting we're going to be re replaced, you know, uh, uh, tomorrow or anything, but it seems like the role of the doctor uh, is going to change over the subsequent, you know, over, over, over subsequent years uh, and, and decades to the point that, you know, sort of what is being valued in a, in a really great uh, clinician. Uh, is is going to shift a little bit um, away from being someone that can can reason through cases and make difficult diagnoses. And I 
I wonder if that's actually not going to be something that is going to be important for physicians to be able to do anymore. I don't know. Yeah, no, I think you're, I think you're me. I think that's right. Um, I, I could just ask the question of you. What do you think? Because yeah, the technology has a long way to go, right? We're seeing a glimpse of the future. So we've probably got, I'll make it to the middle of my career, the middle to the end of my career before the effects are fully felt. And I think it'll be felt on younger trainees first as they grow up with it. And this is what happens when you're old or middle, middle-aged. Um, but yeah, what do you think, Eric? What do you think uh, being an internist in the year 2040 is going to look like with technology? Uh, yeah, I think it's gonna be really different. I think, um, you know, I, I think people are going to be using whether or not it's a, a chat bot like ChatGPT or some other tool that we can't even imagine right now is is essentially going to be listening in on our conversations and making suggestions as we go, um, where, you know, it, as you talk to the patient, you know, you could turn to the AI, you know, either liter literally or figuratively and say, you know, do you have any other ideas? And the AI can be like, oh, you talked about such and such diagnoses. You haven't talked about this. Or I've watched you just do the physical exam. I would also suggest this additional maneuver I didn't see you perform. Um, I, can, I can imagine that. I can imagine uh, in 2040 where the first pass at a patient, a patient comes into the clinic with an uh, you know, acute problem or comes into the ER, uh, the first pass isn't actually with a clinician, a human clinician, um, taking an HMP or taking a history, but rather an, an AI, like, a, like a, a, essentially like a video avatar. And I talked about this on, on Twitter. Um, I don't know if you saw that a few days ago. I saw it. Yeah, I saw it. Where, where um, you know, essentially you, you walk you walk into the urgent care clinic and you're handed an, like, like a tablet and you have a video avatar there. That's an, it's an AI who then interviews you and then they can spend as much time as you need. Um, there's no time limitation for, for, you know, for a computer. And then that avatar then will summarize the case concisely, figure out what's the most important details and then report back to a clinician who's in a, you know, another room. Um, and then the clinician, and then even suggest diagnosis, suggest physical exam maneuvers to perform. And then the clinician comes in and then starts talking to the patient about, you know, essentially you know, summarizing what, what they know about the case, or what the patient's case from the the, uh, the AI, the bot. And then um, and then while the bot's listening in and making sure there's nothing else to add or that the clinician doesn't, doesn't make any errors because that's certainly possible. And I think something that's really interesting, which I haven't seen a, a whole lot of people talk about is that you know, when an AI is listening in on an encounter, whether or not it's participating in the encounter as an, as an active interviewer or just listening in, you know, an AI can be like looking through the patient's medical record in real time, looking for all kinds of details that a human, no human, no matter how smart they are, could ever possibly do um, and say something like, oh, well, based on this test, you know, based on this hemoglobin you had from three years ago, this is what, I, you know, you should also be thinking about this, this, you know, uh, diagnosis or because of you know, these other medications that you were prescribed by this other physician, you know, you need to look out for this medication, medication interaction, uh, things that, again, in real time, a human being, a human interviewer could never possibly keep up with. So I, I think there's there's a ton of interesting potential. And I, I think that what the bedside encounter looks like in 2040 is going to be really, really different than today. And the other major trend that's going on that we can't, because we were talking earlier how both of us assumed that there'd be some sort of Bayesian machine that would be a diagnosis mm -hmm. engine, which is comforting, put, puts it off in the future. Uh, machine, the, the same advances that have spurred large language models have led to increasingly advanced machine learning technologies. There was a paper actually just published in um, in Nature last week that looked at combination of unstructured test with laboratory results and chest imaging as a way to diagnose chest diseases. And this is not a large language model. This is a um, this is it's just a, a, uh, like an unstructured uh, machine learning algorithm, and it performed better than the most expert of physicians. Mind, mind you, only on a single uh, domain and only coming up with a diagnosis. But we're starting to get to this point where these computers are going to make associations that humans are just not capable of, um, that may have like prognostic and diagnostic information. And that's going to be integrated with all of these artificial intelligences. I mean, it already is. It's somewhat to a disaster. If you want to look at the epic sepsis score, right? That was a machine learning algorithm gone horribly wrong. Mm. We're going to see more and more of that in a way that is just inscrutable to you and me. It's inscrutable to humans. We we won't understand why it's saying what it is. And the question is going to be, does it work or not? So it um, it's, I, I think there's no question these things are coming and in, in, it's just a question of when. Yeah. Yeah, what I'm really waiting for is the AI that can code my notes correctly without me having to check them over. <laughs> that's I like think that that's coming pain, quick. That's one of the most that painful things. Money I do for the hospital. <laughs> Un unlike our thinking, that makes money for somebody, so that'll get developed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 
Well, Adam, one final question for you today. Um, is, to the extent that you can talk about it, what what are your future projects in this space going on right now? Like, what what should we look look forward to from you in the future, either either a month from now or, or you know five years from now? What do you, what are you imagining? Yeah, so I'm I'm you you know exactly the answer to this, but I'm really interested in how the human mind. I, like, if you listen to bedside rounds, I'm interested in how the human mind works, and how the human mind itself interacts with technology. So I think the my big clinical questions going forward is. Are large language models able to reason in a way that is similar to humans? What should the standards be for us to accept uh, like clinical decision support from large language models? I think that's a really important question because uh, I asked on Twitter and everyone was like randomized control trials. And I was like, all of you are deluding yourselves. The last time that you used a clinical decision support, you just went to MD Calc and typed it in without looking at any of the data. Like no one... <laughs> No one actually holds it to that standard. So I think that's a good question. What standard should we as physicians accept for the use of these technologies? And then finally, what what happens to our own minds when we use these technologies and what are the implications for training up a new generation of physicians? Yeah, that's what I think that's a really big question at the end is like how how is medical education going to change with the existence of this technology? Because um, it already is. <laughs> yeah, in ways that I, I think it, it's hard. I, I think some people don't even realize how much it's already influencing um, our trainees, I think. And uh, it's going to be hard to, to to keep up with it, I think, um, as a medical educator. Yeah, I mean, we're still like on the discussion of why don't why don't medical students come to lectures? Like that that's a discussion point from like 15 years ago. <laughs> so we'll we'll slowly catch up on why do they use Sketchy, and then finally we'll get to like in 15 years from now, why do they use LLMs? Yeah. Well, Adam, thanks so much for your time today. Um, congratulations on the paper; it's fantastic, and um, uh, yeah, I look forward to to more discussions about this topic uh, and more work together. <laughs> thanks, Eric. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into a paper and chat with one of the authors. This is a new format for this channel, so let me know how you liked it. I may try more of them in the future. Also, of course, feel free to leave questions or comments about ChatGPT in either clinical medicine or medical education.